20 miles off the coast of Uganda, in the unpredictable waters of Lake Victoria, lies an island full of mystery. Unknown even to the local residents, it is an island of musical rocks. Numerous prehistoric stone gongs sit silently beneath the huge granite boulders that characterize Lolui Island. The music of the rocks is soon to be reawakened. In response to this uniquely spiritual setting, rarely visited by outsiders, the Ruinzori Sculpture Foundation has organized a crossover music and visual arts project that will use the ancient rock gongs to inspire a contemporary music performance and exhibition. A group of traditional Ugandan musicians are being taken to Lolui Island by the foundation to collaborate with contemporary classical composer Nigel Osborne and three British musicians from the London Sinfonietta. British sculptor Peter Randall Page will also work alongside the musicians with Ugandan sculptors. This is Peter. Hello, Two sculptors. <laughs> I'm getting more and more excited what as the minutes go past, actually, and this place is, the piece of it is what I mm. love. As a mm. musician, there's no mechanical sound, it's, it's all natural, and it's just bliss. I mean, even the pigeons are not quite the same sound, uh, frogs are definitely not the same sound. Yeah. That's lovely, it's lovely to, lovely to hear all that, you know, just to know that these, there's all these sounds to work with, it's just brilliant. We've met two of the Ugandan musicians now, and they travelled with us. And I think they're probably trained in a very different way to we are. And they obviously play a very different style of music, and so we just have to listen uh, and see how we can contribute as well. Yeah. Uh, we've done a deal, I'm going to teach them some Scottish and Irish folk music, and we'll have an exchange of, uh, uh, of musical uh, inspiration in that way. Before I came, colleagues were sort of suggesting a little bit of cultural imperialism here. Mm -hmm. And I think it's likely to be the other way round. I mean, I just play the trombone. Yeah. I don't know any folk music. Mm. Uh, in fact, we haven't really got any folk music. I don't play any other instruments. I suspect these guys have got a whole lot more to teach us than we've got to teach them, which doesn't mean to say that things can't move in both directions. But uh, I'm a bit apprehensive about that, to be, to be honest. <laughs> but the other thing, big thing, of course, is the rock gongs. And so we'll be um, looking forward to working with those. Uh, in the next days, I hope. So it's very exciting. Recording, trying to work out how to get the best sounds out of them. This is a very beautiful place here on the, on the very northeastern edge of uh, Lake Victoria. Uh, and over there is our island out, and there's some magic shapes on the horizon. I think one of those must be our island. The Ruinzori Sculpture Foundation is keen to encourage cross disciplinary work. The London Sinfonietta regularly explores links between different art forms, but the aim of this island project is to allow artistic experimentation in a broader cultural landscape. How classical Western music styles are combined with traditional Ugandan instruments and rhythms, and how everyone responds to the ancient ring of the gongs, is fertile new ground for both sculptors and musicians. I'm really interested to see what these gongs, these stone gongs, are, are going to be like and, and what sort of sound they make, because I've got a long-standing interest in the relationship between shape and sound. And I've done quite a lot of projects working with composers and musicians on that kind of idea, really. And it's, you know, great. I've just been meeting some of the um, Ugandan musicians, and that's going to be very exciting. The closer we got to the way, the, the more these waves picked up, and the only way to, to get your boat onto the shore is to go as fast as you can, straight at the shore, and you hope you beach. And then of course once the tip of the boat is on the beach, the back of the boat is low and the waves start crashing into the boat. And of course all hell breaks loose because the boat starts to sink. Your bags are on them and there's a lot of important valuable, I mean some of the electronics and some of the recording gear and so on. And we all started getting drenched and you know we're all worried because there's Bill Hunt here. <laughs> So uh, it was a, a nightmare. Well, I didn't feel too good on the boat because I was sick, actually. But uh, I was dying with 
But anyway, all is well, we've arrived. Nature taking its course here, it's wild water. Shetland, okay. island yeah, very north of Scotland. Mm. It's a tune from sailors who, when they went to hunt for whales. Mm. The visitors' camp is the perfect setting for cultural exchange. The camp team have transported all the provisions they need and prepare a healthy breakfast to fortify the artists for the walk in search of the mysterious gongs. Five miles across from east to west, in the world's largest tropical lake, Lolloway Island has no need of roads. It remains isolated by its 25 fathom deep waters and sudden storms. The idea is to seemingly thrust the artists back into a prehistoric era when Africa was still the cradle of mankind. A time when the grass plains and granite tours were home to ancestors who played the oldest musical instruments known to man. The same melody we yes, have it for the sailors. Really? Yeah. Yeah. The, 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 the piece you really? have been singing means really? the sailing. Is the really? Yeah, it is, yeah. It, is, it, is, it is mentioning about the water. Well, there you are. But yeah, maybe where sailing. they got it. Only three rock gongs were documented on Lolloway Island in 1961. Over 40 years later, this project discovered a fourth set of gongs on the other side of Garofa fishing village. The place itself is extraordinary because it's a very bittersweet place. It's, um, it's a very clean and a very dirty place. It has all the opposites in it. The last permanent residents of the island were evacuated in 1908 due to a sleeping sickness epidemic. The current settlers are recent migrants who are unaware the gongs can be played. I pretty much risked my life climbing over those rocks. My heart was pumping faster than I can drum. But what's it all about if you can't do this and you come 3,000 miles to play some rocks? Well, you, know, you get up there and do it. This is also a place where they bury the dead, I think, just beyond here. You sense that. You see the pelicans, the monkeys, the mitre lizards, and the dead, and the sun, and the rocks, and the sea, and the boat. It's uh, very strange. Things that maybe in European modernism we regarded um, as being avant-garde discoveries, discoveries of nature, in fact are here and were discovered by our you know, ancestors sitting and playing these things. Um, it's a wonderful, wonderful depth of sound. This extraordinary mixture of harmonic beauty and dissonance all in one. You know, this extraordinary discovery of the world of sound and vibration. You know, this, this is the closest we'll ever get to understanding nature. I'm really interested to know whether there is a way in which one can make something which has both a, a visual and, a, and an auditory synchronicity, if you like, where the, the way it looks and the way it sounds both come together to create a phenomenon which is more than the sum of the parts. But it would be wonderful if certain shapes made certain sounds which went together and complemented one another. When the shape is right, it kind of has a, has a sort of ring to it. I mean, obviously not an audible ring, but it has a kind of hum of rightness, a sort of tone of rightness about it, which is very difficult to describe. And actually, the only way I can really think of it is in, in musical terms. When I'm making sculpture, I often think of it rather like tuning a musical instrument. The Western Orchestra is a, a rather nice resonator. Uh, it has a great potential for a wide range of colour and resonance and I intend to put the resonance of these rocks into the orchestra uh, and express their logic through the resonance of the orchestra to express their monumental nature through 
the blocks of sound and sections, one that follows another, one that comes on top of another. I don't know why, why they become so beautifully rounded, and also they seem to split very cleanly um, and in seemingly fairly random sort of places, which I'm, I really don't understand geologically what that's all about, but they are absolutely magnificent forms and uh, quite stunning, incredibly sculptural and quite the most beautiful rocks I've ever seen, I think. But the pictures up here are fantastic. This one here, I mean, it's just like a bell. I mean, I've played with bells in schools and so on that uh, ring much less than that. It's really quite a fantastic piece of rock. The ones that the guys are playing down there at the moment that you can hear, they also seem to ring and they sit loose. So I think there's something really special going on here in the way these rocks are created. If we remember the Stone Age time, maybe during that Stone Age time and before the current instruments we are looking at, they might have played the stones because now we are we are now, we have, we have decided to play the stones as an adventure and uh, we are getting out the melodies where they, those two have been playing, which we claim for ancestors. Maybe that's the beginning was here. You can't play pentatonic there because no string can reach that tone. Unless if we are, it is a composition in the Western style that can fit on the other ones. Nigel, David and myself are going to listen to all the spectrums I'd photograph them, notate down the, the best playing spot on each one, so we can go home and write them up um, and record them very accurately. I climbed up into the, the um, area underneath that huge rock at the top, and in that almost perfect dome, uh, which is presumably a naturally occurring thing, there are some amazing rock drawings really done in ochre, and I've just been up there and, and sketched some of them, well sketched all of them actually, and documented them quite thoroughly in a series of drawings and photographs. And uh, it, it's quite phenomenal to think that, you know, I may, may well have been the first person to actually go up there and draw these things. Ugandan folk music is based on a pentatonic scale. So to discover a more worn gong in perfect tune with this five note scale, below less indented rocks that resonated to higher western pitches was very moving. And searching for the next gong gives time for reflection. It's possible that the pentatonic scale system itself can come from something like this, inspiring song in one of the most anciently populated parts of Africa, what was pretty much the cradle of civilization. It's just not too, not too hard to believe that um, perhaps music and song started in this place. This particular scale system uh, helped to clarify traditional song. This gong has over 20 different playing positions. And what was really interesting was that the, the classically trained musicians, we sat back and these the young African guys from Kampala were just straight in there with the most extraordinary pattern. They're obviously they're, they're rhythms that they know themselves, but they're frustrated and they're working really hard and hurting their hands and uh, hitting them hard and loud and getting the incredible excitement going. And what was interesting is the one um, of us European visitors who was really going for it was Peter, the sculptor, who was doing all sorts of interesting experiments and scraping the rock with the stone to get a sort of scratching effect. And all these things, really, really going for it and getting kind of physically involved. And it, it says something about the way that we are as musicians and the way that they are as musicians. And, it, you know, it reflects quite badly on us, I think, in some ways. When I play it, I feel like I'm playing this elephant. And I think if we get more time, get organized, and uh, try to get proper stones, I think, and proper chosen pieces, 
we may form out something which is more wonderful than what we have done. Because today, today was just a trial. We can't carry this with us, <laughs> so, uh, okay, so we, have to, we have to work through the medium of recording. Uh, but also just to record the sounds and, and isolate these beautiful harmonies. It would have been, I mean, we could actually take that sound, as you know, in the studio and we can just hear it as, as the pure resonance harmony. I think it would be very nice to, mm. to do something uh, with that. And slowly again, slowly. Very slow. Just, just one note, I mean, the, the individual sounds in themselves are wonderful, um, and the, the unusual resonances. And I'm kind of half torn to thinking it's, it's the cave that's making the resonance, but it's not. It's, it's the stone, because if you hit on the other side, actually there's no sound at all. It's a phenomenon that actually um, I'm quite familiar with from, from working with stone and piling stones up one on top of the other. And just knowing that when you hit a stone that's under certain sorts of pressures from other weights, and it's particularly if it's pinched, um, like this one is, I mean, this is sitting there bearing on a very, very small area. This thing's got to weigh several hundred tons, I would think. But to see it on this scale and to see that people have obviously used it in this way from the marks on the stone for, you know, goodness knows how long, um, it's absolutely fantastic. <laughs> phrasing that you use on patterns, Bernard, I was looking at what you're playing and thinking, how would I write that down? And I could write it down, but it would never sound the same if I played it. Whereas the way you guys do it, it, ro it rolls yeah. like a rock down a hill. Now, if you count our way, one, uh, 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 it doesn't fit. It doesn't, it's not, it's it, 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 to, to the way that we write, yeah. it doesn't work. Yeah. If you write the rhythms, when I try to interpret them, mm. you will see them blocking. But ours has almost the same, same, same demis quivers, whereby it's the chain of the metal is running one after the other. They keep on running, they keep on running, they keep on running until maybe you end. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, you put those flavors, the flows behind, which may be harmonizing the original notes, and then you keep on running like yeah. that. I live on the edge of Dartmoor and uh, of course I'm used to granite outcrops and, and tours and so on but the scale and the beauty of, of these geological formations is quite breathtaking. I work primarily with stone and often with naturally occurring eroded boulders. I mean the whole island consists of eroded, beautifully rounded and very sculptural granite outcrops. My response to it has been to actually work on one particular rock which was naturally split in half here where we're camping. I've tried to encapsulate that whole sense of sound coming out of the centre of a rock by inscribing these low relief concentric patterns on the, on the split surfaces and I'm using ochre to sort of highlight that. <laughs> When tools were in short supply, the sculpture team used local materials to make their own. They had lent their mallets to the musicians, who were now testing tones at the rock gong above the camp. To me, I feel if we could find the strongest tones like this, the strongest sound, you hear it. There is something which is natural. Just hit that with the wood now. Hit that with the wood, exactly the same. Okay, can we, can we, uh, can we really hear this? That's oh, okay, now. Another stone. Shh, shh, shh. The sound is across. In the wood. Hold it, there's still some talking. By me? Brilliant. There, there. Good. Yes. Yeah. Okay, just one note. Okay, and now just one. Just, just one note. Boom. <laughs> Great. <laughs> if you get a stone which you can hold properly and it can give that weight properly, because these stones, some of them are very small, as you hit it, it keeps on reducing itself. By the end, it has remained very small. That also affects the product. And exactly the same again, once more. Thank <laughs> you.
when I was thinking about doing something here, I was very uh, dubious about the idea of doing anything which was too much of a, a bold kind of intervention, a permanent intervention in the place. In the event, I have actually carved into stone, which I didn't think I was going to do, partly because the scale of this thing, it makes it m less like part of the landscape. It's not like one of these big boulders that's actually embedded in the ground. It's small enough to be a, an artifact, to be a thing, um, rather than to be part of the landscape. I'm going to uh, work the other one with a mirror image of this pattern, um, and then I'll roll that one over and I'll roll that one that way so that they're sitting in the correct orientation as if they'd just broken apart and they are part of the same, you know, they're two halves of one rock. The music and the, the sound that come from the stone also inspired me a lot. The integration actually is in the Western kind of music and our own African sound. <laughs> We're all sitting around in a circle and making music together and we're not reading anything. We're using our ears. We're listening to each other and we're learning it by ear. So I've learned to tune uh, with my colleague here, Kim, on the flute and I've begun to learn the rhythm. It's not quite how I expected. It's much more complex in the middle. I'm just beginning to feel it now. It's rather nice, this whole project to do with music. Actually having carvings is music as well, it's great. Liberating. It doesn't come better than this when musicians sit down for the first time to play. The outcome, the melody, has been the best. We are all one. I've come to believe that music can talk without any other language. This instrument, the violin, it comes from an instrument that came from the Arabic world in, in the 12th, 13th centuries. Uh, to Europe, and the same Arabic instrument, the rebab, influenced the tuba, fiddle. The, these are relatives. They, they come from the same genes, musical genes. This is a replica of the, the gong we saw. Yeah. That looks like the head. Oh, so right. That's why I suggested this line to make it. Which one, which one is the one that looks like the head? The one, the other one, the one down the end of yeah, the island. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I've got some challenge here. Yeah. Because when you look at the other gong, it has some kind of depression here. Right. So moving this chunk off. Yeah. So I mean, shall I just have a little chip at it? And yeah, yeah, please. I mean, you want to take off material from here? Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. To this kind yeah. of chip. Yeah. I mean, as I say, it's just a matter of working over the surface mm. like that. Mm. Just pecking at it. Mm. As long as you're working downwards, you just mm. let the weight of the hammer do the work. Fantastic. It's yeah. going to be a nice piece. And that's going to go underneath there? Yeah, yeah, sure. Mm. That's actually, it has to fit in like this. Mm. Oh, it's easier to move the wood, it's cheaper to move the Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah great. Yeah, I was inspired by the gong. Fantastic. The head. Yeah. So I had to bring in my subject matter. Lovely. Which is this. It's a really nice piece. <laughs> Thank you. Fantastic. You've done an awful lot of work while you've been here. It's nice to contrast the materials, isn't it? It's lovely. Thank you. Meanwhile, the British musicians find a quiet moment to return to the gongs to analyse individual rock pitches. But it's almost as if you can hear a fundamental in it yeah, as well. Yeah, there's a wagon almost here. There'd be, and also between the F-sharp and E, there's almost a hint of an F, isn't there? The rock itself, because it's a very dense material, it vibrates in all sorts of interesting and unusual ways. And uh, we think it's the crystalline structure and the rock is actually the thing that's vibrating. The rock as a whole isn't, isn't sort of moving itself like a, a normal percussion instrument or cymbal. And uh, because it's very, very dense, it gives off all sorts of interesting harmonics, all sorts of combinations of sound. And as you move your beta around the rock face, they change. The piano sounds like it does because of the overtones and the oboe sounds like it does because of the overtones. You're never actually hearing 
one note. But what's interesting is the particular notes yeah. and how strongly you hear them. Da, da, dee, ba, ba. All those kinds of sounds you'd expect to get. We've got those, but we've got some really beautiful dissonances as well. And if you start hitting it over and over again, you can hear them begin to resonate mm. and resonate. And there's four or five sounds in that that we can sing and that we hear them resonate. I'd like to take them back to Electroacoustic Studio and I would like to take them through a process of revealing more clearly these inner structures without altering them. We won't corrupt the sound and we'll have a series of really, I think, iridescent musical objects that we can compose with. There are some what seem to be pupae cases in here, Nigel, but they're clearly covered in manuscript paper. The patterning on them uh, is crotchets, quavers, um, sets of lines, and I can see a pair of quavers here that have staccato dots. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's the ode to joy. Maybe how, as human beings, when we're inventing signs, we reinvent the things that we've noticed from nature and patterns that are there already. Nature invented crotches and quavers and manuscript paper. I heard this noise. That's amazing. I thought, that sounds like, you know, several million flies. <laughs> and I thought, well, that can't be. I'm just imagining it. <laughs> so I went back to sleep. Um, uh, but it was several million flies. That deep. The zip doesn't pull quite to the end on the tent. And uh, they can all come in through that. <laughs> but we'll learn our lesson we'll learn now. Our Trial by flies. Do you, think, do you think fly mass suicide is insecticide? <laughs> The idea of taking people away from the safe, controlled environments of workshops or recording studios to make art in a natural, acoustic and wild setting is a challenge that often brings out the best in creative people because it imposes new limitations, helping them feel close to history, close to the elements and close to the dangers of the wilderness. Actually, this isn't an Eden at all. If you were to live here really and uh, to, to know the wilds well, well, there are, there are puff adders around and we've seen one. Plenty of, of animals will take a bite out of you and deep down it's a wild and uh, ferocious island and much of it hasn't changed for many thousands of years, I think. Yeah, really wonderful. I'm not at all surprised that this is um, a special and probably a sacred, ancient sacred site. It's such an extraordinary, spatially, it's absolutely incredible, this enormous rock just resting on these few smaller rocks around the edge and apparently hasn't been looked at properly by anybody except amateur archaeologists in the 60s. If this was in Europe, there'd be thousands of people coming to look at this. It's absolutely astonishing. White yeah, and then the red. that's right. I hadn't noticed that. You know, they're not incised in any way. And these clearly are very, very ancient. I mean, how they've lasted quite this long, I mean, what the medium is that the oak is with, I've no idea, but it's got to be something some pretty... Fat. Yeah, some sort of animal fat. And these, you know, this is... I mean, there's a several of these. What's yes. interesting is they don't... You know, they're sort of not joined up at this point, so you've got this kind of maze-like thing. There are a lot of paintings here as well. I mean, you can see them very clearly on the left which is amazing because actually this is exposed to the weather um, and it's astonishing how sharp they are after so long. Obviously a lot of it's been obscured by this recent um, writing which one hopes is in uh, uh, water-based paint. I mean, I dare say a, you know, a, a restorer could probably do something about it but um, I mean it's an incredibly beautiful place. I mean, extraordinary, extraordinary landscape. Differences between the African and British musicians have so far been great. How easy will it be to create a new form of music that combines their musical styles and can later be played by the London Symphony at Orchestra? Will one style be more influential than another? And will their different instruments tune together? Mm -hmm.
Now what we are on is to see how these instruments fit in the sounds that come out of the rock. From this end to the other, there are several tones within a simple stone. So we are picking which one fits the strings properly so that they have to come. The melodies and the notes may come out properly. The presence of the artists is a big sensation on the island. As a recently settled community, the local people have few cultural traditions themselves and have not had foreign visitors since missionaries in the early 80s. The activities of both sculptors and musicians have become increasingly irresistible. I've had a lot of lot of comments from all sorts of people, a lot of comments from the local people as well. I mean, people talked about whether it was to do with, um, somehow to do with the fact we're on the equator here, this pattern related to that, perhaps. Um, somebody else said it uh, made them think about the eclipse of the sun. But uh, people have been absolutely delightful. Most people have never seen stone carving before, even though it's a very, um, very slight bit of stone carving. It's just a a series of incised lines into the surface of the rock. People have been quite interested and intrigued because I think they don't have a tradition very much of making things here at all and certainly not making things in stone. I think the only thing they do with the stone is to break it up to make fishing weights. Um, so there has been a, a very nice and very warm and positive response from, from local people which has been lovely. <laughs> Oh, it's brilliant, isn't it? I haven't been in a, in a tent since I was a child. Admittedly, this is pretty five-star treatment here, isn't it? But it's, it's been most enjoyable. And very beautiful having, having the sculptors with us. It's made me look uh, at the rocks with a new eye. I kind of recognised that they were beautiful, uh, but it made me realise how beautiful they are. From my point of view, it was really uh, a response to the actual shape of the, of the stone and the, the ochre that's used on the paintings, the ancient paintings in the, in the caves associated with the gongs and also to some extent determined by what I could actually do, uh, physically achieve within six or seven days. Also the sense a little bit of, um, of the idea, you know, the whole project being to do with sound coming from stone, the whole idea of this sort of uh, ripples, these kind of concentric pattern working out from the centre. But what I didn't want is for it to look like a kind of target, so I tried to avoid that by having a little kind of uh, slightly amorphous shape in the centre rather than ending up with a circle in the middle. I wanted to get it so that the morning light would hit across this face and uh, and actually bring out the relief in the carving because with this sort of low relief carving it makes an enormous difference if you've got oblique light. So we set this part of the sculpture more or less in an east-west axis so that as the sun comes up it would strike across the surface and actually bring out the relief which it does so I'm really pleased with that. It's worked quite well. Dissecting those, those sounds was quite hard. I was amazed that how Nigel could hear so well. Yes, it's making me really go deep inside the oboe. What can I get out of this that's, that's completely unusual? I'm sort of splitting it up like the sounds I'm hearing. It's more than one note. One note is strong, but other and other notes as well. There's five, six notes at the same hit, that's and right. some of them move. But within those, some of the notes just stay the same. So it must go bam, but the other one might go bam, bam. Just move. So you must imagine the first sound going on somewhere, <laughs> and then you get something as complicated as this.
to be honest, it has given us the people who play the, the, the percussion uh, a very uh, hard time to see, to fit actually in. I think by the end of the session, we'll be ready together with the, the rest of the musicians and we'll bring out something good. This is every, little, every note there came from the rock. It was very interesting for us to see how um, African musicians would relate to those sounds uh, in terms of the ones that they preferred and the way they approached and the structures they built from them. Because in a sense, African music has probably retained a closer link to those things than European music has. What we could bring um, was the, the kind of scientific approach to it, and that's why we were meticulously recording all the frequencies we could hear, and also the modernist approach. When a hornbill spontaneously answers the violin, the modernist approach allows the musicians to incorporate its responses into their music as they develop their improvisation up at the gongs. The modernist idea that there is something really beautiful hidden inside sound in the universe, that the things that are in objects as you sound them can give us sensations, logics, patterns that can be very important to extract and make things with, that is confirmed by this. As a composer, I'm a little bit medieval. Medieval composers thought of the world in three spheres. Musica mundana, the music of the spheres and the spirit. Uh, musica instrumentalis, the musical instruments, and musica humana, the music of human beings and humanity. And I feel touched on all three levels in this, very, very much so. Um, the rock gongs touch all of those levels, the strange spiritual resonances. What is the spirit? It's what we don't know that moves us. It's not mumbo drum, but it's what we don't know, can't know and instrumentally speaks for itself. These are extraordinary instruments, and that's influencing me where the sound. And human, perhaps most of all, that comes from the musicians, Ugandan musicians. And they're fabulous musicians, the Ugandans. We've got on very, very well, I think, on a personal level, and we've got on very well musically as well. We've understood what it is each other wants to do, and I think we've got a very nice marriage of what they do and what we do. The rock gongs have been a revelation I had no idea that they would sound so beautiful and to go on then and bring some of the music out of the rocks it has just been a, a very special experience. And I would hope in the music that I write from this will carry that deepening of emotion, human communication, beauty, love, brilliance and dark. The rock guns were a meeting point. We were all discovering something together at the same point that was of equal relevance to our histories because this is the cradle of mankind. And it wasn't just the ancestors of the Ugandan musicians that played those gongs. Ours did. So that, that added something that we could all discover part of our own musical roots. Where did those men go? Those who manage to sit and think and try the stones until they got out their melodies. There are so many stones, but there are very few with their melodies. How did they come to find out that such a stone has a melody the others don't have? That is what is still puzzling. <laughs> was beautiful. The team now have to consider how they transpose the sound of the gongs into the orchestra for future performances. Well, we're going to try and devise a sample, create a sample of keyboard, whereby um, we can arrange it and label it, the different rock gongs. And there's maybe 40 sounds here. So it needs a three-octave keyboard or so. And um, so that people can play. 
and can get the sounds out. They can play melodies together uh, across the different rock drums. It's the whole island of Lillaway resonating to these sounds. And then if we do a performance, we can play it as part of the performance. This is shown that within our country, Uganda, but we have no musician has ever come near here. So we are very, very, very proud to have been one among the millions in the world to play the stones where our ancestors played. We have definitely achieved the greatest thing in our lives and we hope if we carry it on, we shall bring a unique version of the music to the whole world.